Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our Arithmetic Cyber Chat. Uh, we do this every Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you are welcome to the Arithmetic family if you are new. I'm Dr. Emmanuel Edu. I'm going to be uh, the facilitator for this uh, Cyber Chat. And today uh, we have the privilege of discussing. We are continuing our series on uh, GRC frameworks. And today we'll be looking at uh, one of the the big players when it comes to frameworks in cybersecurity, uh, which is the next uh, catalog of uh, frameworks. So uh, before we start, I know you know some people know about NIST and uh, some of the frameworks. Uh, I'm going to open the floor. Uh, some I know on here, uh, some of our students are currently working in positions uh, mm -hmm. that they are using NIST, like some of the frameworks, uh, the FESMA and RMF, uh, are the most popular, uh, arguably maybe probably the most popular. Uh, but I'm going to open the floor. At least three or four people. What do you know about NIST? Uh, what frameworks are you familiar with? And then we will start. You know, give some background, and then uh, we will look at uh, almost all of the frameworks, uh, all the publications, or all the standards that have been set forth by NIST. Uh, so if you want to uh, contribute, you can raise your virtual hand. Then we give you the floor, uh, but just three people, and then we are going to start uh, the main uh, presentation that we have for tonight. So if you are familiar with NIST, what framework are you using? Uh, how do you use it? Right. Uh, so if anybody want to contribute, or I know at least I've seen one name on here that I'm going to call out. Right. Yeah, but I'm just going to leave the floor first, and then I'll, I'll probably uh, call people that I know on here who are using NIST. And, and if you just have a general idea about NIST, what it is, you can also uh, raise your virtual hand and uh, let us know what you know about NIST. So the floor is open to everybody. Well, nobody knows about NIST, I don't think so. Uh, I know. I know, I know a little bit, Dr. Okay. Okay. But... <laughs> Not too much because when I was off the radar, I learned a little bit about information assurance. Um, okay. I dive a little bit deep into that. And um, to my experience, they use NIST, you know, uh, to categorize systems. Uh, it depends on the system. I don't know if it's uh, really specialized for the government side, but then, you know, they were basing a lot on that, you know, how to uh, assess basically how to assess, you know, controls and implement controls of the, like, they use it for that, but I don't know much about it, but that's what I know about this different type of publications and what you can get over there. So that's my okay. little thought about it. All right. Uh, anybody else want to uh, contribute? Okay, now I'm going to start calling out people that I know are, are using this. Uh, Ernest, Ernest Carter is one of them. Uh, Ernest, if you are able to get on audio, uh, what frameworks in this are you using at work? One seven one. Oh, one seven one. Okay, that is, but that wasn't Ernest though. Yeah, that was that was a he's a he's yeah okay thank you a he's 171 uh how do you use 171 uh i believe it's uh what the government uses uh the framework that the government uses for their systems okay we, we basically use it as a, a framework for our cybersecurity audit audits Is there another okay. I think, uh, I don't know, but uh, maybe probably Ernest is not able to get on audio. Yeah, he said he's not, he's unable to speak, probably. Okay, so uh, we are going to jump into NIST, uh, what NIST is all about. Okay, uh, go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, I just want to say we use NIST standards in our job to to harden our technical architecture. 
you know, against the intrusion and and we use it for our, for applications that are being built just not only to prevent uh, cybersecurity break ins, but we've used it just as a standard security requirements for all applications that are being uh, developed. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. And Ernest says he's using a NIST privacy framework. Okay. Uh, Jay Webster says he is not unable to speak. All right, that's fine. So uh, we will start. All right, everyone. Uh, so we are starting with our NIST. NIST. Uh, Doctor, can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just feel this question will kind of put everybody in the right perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we'll be talking about frameworks, 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 um, back and forth. So when, when you posted this question, you said NIST, like an umbrella word that has so many frameworks. I was thinking NIST is a framework on its own. GROC is a framework on its own. But from your point of view right now, it, you, 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 you kind of sound like NIST is, is a catalog that has different frameworks that we use for um, um, cybersecurity. It's not yes. a question, like it's a contribution kind of, I don't understand. Okay, so uh, good question. I'm going to explain that. So uh, you said you were thinking GRC is a framework. Uh, GRC is not a framework. Uh, GRC is uh, an area or a specialized area in cybersecurity. Uh, so GRC covers uh, everything in cybersecurity that falls under governance, risks, and compliance, right? And under governance, risks, and compliance, because of compliance uh, aspect of it, there are standards that organizations have to stay in compliance to, right? And those standards are what we normally term as frameworks, right? So some are mandatory by law, uh, some are mandatory by the industry, some are just you know uh, nice to have or best practices that if you follow, uh, is gonna help you get off the radar of uh, attackers, right? Now NIST, we are going to talk about NIST, so I'm not even gonna go much into it. Now with the frameworks, right, uh, or the standards, there are publications that are made by different organizations, right? So sometimes the frameworks or the publications will take the name of the organization as well. So an example is the CIS controls. CIS is an organization, right? They are the ones who came up with a standard, uh, the CIS controls. And so their name is attached to it. Now that doesn't mean CIS itself. So when we say CIS uh, framework, we are normally referring to the CIS controls, right? But CIS itself is an organization. Same thing with NIST. NIST is an organization that does a, a whole lot aside uh, information security or cyber security, right? Uh, it's a full-blown organization that has an office, uh, so many offices and labs around the United States. Uh, so NIST is, so when we say NIST frameworks, uh, we are referring to frameworks or standards uh, or publications that have been produced by NIST as an organization. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so it does. GRC, and the GRC is where we have all these standards because those standards, they uh, predominantly fall under the compliance aspect of cybersecurity. Right. Okay. Meaning that NIST framework is applicable to every industry, like uh, healthcare, uh, payment card industry, and all of that. It, it meaning you can tailor the the frameworks to every industry. So yeah, we are getting a bit ahead of ourselves, but uh, okay. yes, I'll still address that question. So for uh, NIST has a whole catalog of frameworks, a whole, they are probably the, the, the only organization that has a framework for, or a standard for almost everything, right? Uh, so far, like for almost, I mean, for, <laughs> for almost everything. Right, uh, they are similar to like ISO, right? Uh, for so ISO is international for the whole world. Uh, ISO has a whole variety of cybersecurity and information security uh, standards or frameworks. 
but then they also have other standards outside uh, IT or outside, uh, outside information security. Same thing with NIST, but NIST is specifically for the United States, right? So uh, frameworks uh, by NIST, uh, we will look at them. Those frameworks uh, for NIST, uh, we are uh, like I don't want to get too uh, too much ahead of ourselves, but NIST is owned by the United States government, right? So all uh, information security standards that they make, they are specifically, or their main audience is United States uh, government agencies, right? For the corporate side, they can choose to use it or not to use it, unless so corporate side if they are uh, like if company like Arithmetic Inc. It has to use NIST uh, and is mandatory, then it means we are doing something for the government in terms of contracts, right? So we have to follow uh, the government standards. Aside that, uh, if we are on our own doing our own thing uh, on the corporate side, we don't necessarily have to follow anything NIST uh, in terms of their standards. But for government agencies, uh, they don't have that luxury. Uh, those standards are made specifically for them and they have to follow it and use it. Right? So depending on what agency and what they are doing, there is a whole you know catalog of frameworks that they have to follow. Okay? So NIST can be used, but they have some really good best practices. Uh, so it can be used on the corp some corporate uh, organizations use it. Uh, I know a lot that uses it, uh, but those are kind of like the general uh, frame, uh, like the general areas uh, like incident response, risk management, you know, uh, but uh, corporate side, they don't necessarily have to follow it if they don't want to, or if they are not working directly uh, in, for the government. Okay. So I hope that helps. Yeah, it's a lot clearer now. Thank you very much, Doctor. Okay, you're welcome. So welcome everybody once again, uh, we are starting off cyber chats every uh, Friday, 7 p.m. Eastern. And once we're done, we post this on YouTube and uh, I'll encourage everybody here to check out our YouTube channel and also to subscribe. So if you miss cyber chats, once we post it on there, you are going to get it, okay? So welcome to Arrhythmus uh, Academy. This cyber chat uh, is through Arrhythmus Academy. I'm Dr. Emmanuel Edu. I'm going to be your facilitator for this uh, program. I'm a former United States Army captain. I'm a QSA, uh, working for a QSA company, Arrhythmus Inc. I'm the CEO of the QSA company uh, in question. Uh, I'm the founder of Arrhythmus Academy. Uh, I'm a former professor at the University of Maryland Global uh, College, uh, and then also CTC. I love everything, anything cybersecurity. Uh, and I am very passionate you know, about sharing uh, knowledge and tips in cybersecurity with the whole entire community. So uh, Arrhythmus Academy, uh, we put this up every Friday to help educate the community and also uh, to help facilitate cybersecurity education and, and cybersecurity awareness, right? So tonight we'll be talking about NIST. Uh, we kind of started the conversation already. Uh, we will look at what NIST is, uh, the history behind NIST cybersecurity. And then also we will look at the catalog of uh, NIST cybersecurity standards or frameworks. And I think when we did the GRC, we started with the GRC actual, uh, we talked about the difference between frameworks and standards or the similarities, you know, so we're probably not going to get into that. You can get that video and take a look at it, right? So we are starting off with NIST. We've seen, we've looked at a couple of uh, frameworks uh, so far. We, I think we did a MIDAR attack. We looked at CIS controls. Uh, we looked at ISO uh, and a couple more, right? Tonight we are looking at NIST, and NIST is one of the big players in the cyberspace, right? Uh, globally, uh, in the United States, they are kind of the only uh, player when it comes to coming up with standards. Uh, not they are like they are the biggest, right? And they are the ones that are backed by the government. Everybody else uh, is on the corporate side. So NIST stands for NIST is an acronym that stands for National Institute of Standards and Technology, right? So I was saying that it's similar to ISO, uh, that is the International Standard Organization, uh, Standardization or Standard Organization. So NIST, uh, 
Uh, it was founded in 1901 by uh, United States Congress, and it works under the United States Department of Commerce. And now also for everybody, uh, cybersecurity in the United States, it falls under everything and anything cybersecurity falls under the United States Department of Commerce. They are the ones who control cybersecurity. So NIST falls under United States uh, Department of Commerce, right? It's one of the uh, oldest science labs within the United States, right? Uh, they have a catalog of uh, laboratories around the United States and offices uh, around the United States. And the goal behind the formation of NIST uh, was to compete in the industrial uh, revolution era. And also, you know, uh, during the world wars, uh, you know, in terms of like technology and trade, so uh, it bordered on technology and uh, economy, right? So uh, it was put in place to help compete, to help make the United States more competitive when it comes to uh, trade and technology and, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, empowerment in general, right? So uh, that was the idea behind the formation of NIST. And uh, NIST, they have a whole variety of standards. Uh, they, they, they work in different areas. Uh, so we will look at some of these areas and information security or IT is part of the areas that they're working. Uh, I'm not sure of any area within, you know, what we do as uh, people within the United States or around the world that NIST doesn't have something to do with, right? So the mission of NIST is to promote uh, US innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science, standards and technology uh, in ways to enhance economic security and also improve our quality of life, right? And the ambition uh, is to become a world leader when it comes to creating critical measurement solutions and promoting uh, equitable standards. And uh, they've been doing so. And I think, you know, they are getting close to their vision or they are there, right? Uh, although one of their big competitors is ISO, like I said earlier on. So some of the things that NIST does, uh, you know, stands from smart electric power grids, you know, uh, electric health records, keeping atomic clock and, you know, uh, computer chips and a whole variety of things uh, that they do. And these are some of the core competencies of NIST. Uh, measurement science, rigorous uh, traceability, development and use of standards, right? So we are not, our interest tonight is standards as it pertains to information security, right? So the rest, uh, we just, there's something nice to see or know, but we're not really gonna uh, bother ourselves much with it, right? Now, these are some of the publications or some of the standards uh, that NIST has so far, right? Under building and construction, they have 3,000 and change. Under fire, they have 3,000 and plus. Uh, uh, metrology, they have uh, 2,000 and uh, over 2,000. Now the list goes on information technology over 2000. So physics, uh, material, uh, bio biomaterials, chemistry, electromagnetics. Uh, our main focus for us is cybersecurity and uh, also information technology, right? So cybersecurity, they have 1,329 uh, publications, right? It's about 200 or three, almost 300 of which uh, our cybersecurity frameworks or information security frameworks, right? And we will look at those. Uh, we will look at almost all of it. We will go through the list, uh, highlighting some of the popular ones that uh, most of you might be uh, used to, right? So this goes to show you that NIST, you know, has their hands full, working on a lot of projects, coming up with different standards, which cybersecurity and information uh, security or uh, information technology is part, right? But there is a whole list of other things that they do. So when we, that is why uh, mostly in information security, when we talk about NIST, we are referring to the frameworks within NIST, but NIST uh, is an organization that does more than information security or cybersecurity. And I'm pretty sure uh, these other areas, when you talk about NIST within the building and construction uh, sector, 
they might also be referring to frameworks that they have to you know comply with right so uh depending on the industry when you say this it will mean something else right so we are going to look at NIST cybersecurity frameworks, uh, NIST cybersecurity. So focusing on the cybersecurity uh, publications within NIST, right? So uh, within NIST, they have uh, three categories of publications that borders on cybersecurity. We will look at it, but we will, we will start with their 800 series. They have uh, a publication they call special publication and on a special publication, they have the 800 series, they have the 1500, and I think the 500 series or 1800. I'm not sure. We will look at that shortly here. But they have three main uh, special publication series for cybersecurity or information security. So the 800 series, it was created around 1990. And the goal of it was to uh, focus more on uh, researching uh, into uh, government, industry, and academia, uh, collaborating with them and also uh, researching uh, into how well uh, the department, how well NIST will be able to come up with standards that was going to help the United States, uh, the United States federal government to uh, ensure that data and uh, information and information systems were kept safely, right? So that was the goal. Uh, or that is still the goal of all the NIST publications, uh, NIST special uh, publications within the 800 series, right? And other series, uh, they follow the same thing, right? So uh, within the 800, the, the 800 comes up with the 800 series and all other publications. Uh, the goal is to come up with guidelines, recommendations, technical specifications uh, for cybersecurity or and we would simply say they uh, these frameworks or standards uh, under the special series, uh, under the special publication, the 800 series, uh, they they come up with best security practices, right? And they also show us when it comes to the technical side how to specifically do uh, certain things to help keep uh, federal government uh, systems and data safe, right? And like I said earlier on, NIST uh, was formed by Congress under the Department of Commerce, right? So everything that NIST is doing is backed by law. So uh, the 800 series came into existence based on the law FESMA. I know most of you are familiar with FESMA. So FESMA is Federal Information Security uh, Modernization Act uh, that was enacted uh, 2014. An earlier version was enacted, I think, 2012, and then 2014, uh, they made some improvements to it, right? So under FESMA is how all these next publications came about, okay? So use, uh, addressing Michael's uh, question that he brought up, who is supposed to use NIST publications or the special NIST publications uh, or NIST frameworks within uh, the cybersecurity area of NIST, uh, who is supposed to use these or, uh, so for government use, all federal agencies uh, and state agencies, some state agencies, they have to uh, use specific, you know, uh, frameworks or specific standards within uh, the NIST catalog. So depending on what they do, there is a whole list of them, uh, like a whole list of uh, standards that they can use. Right for non-government use, that is for the corporate side. It is best practices. It is nice to have or nice to use. Uh, it serves as a good uh, starting point for information security within any organization, but they don't have to use it, right? And some of it, uh, frankly, some of it does not really apply to the corporate side, right? Some you can you know uh, tweak here and there and still apply. Some you know does not really apply, but for corporate bodies who have to, uh, who are working directly with the government. Uh, sometimes they are obliged to use some of these or comply with some of these standards uh, or frameworks. Okay, so that is the use. For the government side, it is almost everybody has to use it. Uh, for the corporate side, if you are not working directly with the government, you know, you can use it as one of the frameworks uh, that you are using in combination with other frameworks 
uh, out there to help secure your environment. Uh, but either than that, you don't really have to use it. So like I was talking about, yes, I think it was the 50, 1800, not 1500. So types of NIST special publications that are out there. Uh, and these are the publications that focuses predominantly on uh, information security or cybersecurity. So we have the special publication 800 series. We have the eight, uh, uh, 1800 series and we have the 500 series, right? So under the 800 series, there's a whole list of frameworks that we are going to uh, go through and everybody's going to see. Uh, under the 1800, there's a whole list there to 500, still same thing. Now 800 covers uh, computer security, uh, 1800 covers uh, com uh, cyber security uh, practice guides, right? So uh, guidelines for uh, cyber security and then uh, 500 series covers information technology, right? So these are some of the, pop not all the popular ones, but uh, most like with most people, their first exposure to NIST will be the 800-53, uh, NIST Special Publication 800-53, which covers security and privacy controls for information systems and organizations. Uh, this is this one, almost every federal agency, uh, almost every federal uh, agency and most state agencies have to uh, use this to set up, the, to do the initial setup uh, for their yeah, information for their yeah, uh, IT infrastructure, right? And for uh, special publication 800-37, RMF, most people who, you know, are, are exposed to RMF, this is the publication uh, that covers RMF, right? Risk Management Framework for Information Systems and Organization. And this also, this framework or this standard, almost all uh, federal agencies or all federal agencies have to use this. Uh, to mitigate risks or to do risk assessment and risk analysis. Uh, and there is a new uh, special publication 207 is very new. Uh, I don't think it's been around for, uh, I think it came up this year, I think. Uh, and is the only, is the only, so far as I know, uh, is the only uh, cybersecurity publication on zero trust architecture, right? Is the only one, maybe probably somebody came up with something uh, or some organization came up with some that I don't know, but this is the only one. Zero trust used to be a concept uh, within the industry, uh, but NIST has solidified it and has actually made it a standard. Uh, so you can, if your organization needs to use zero trust, uh, this is a good place to uh, start the ball rolling. It gives you a lot of good info, uh, how to set it up and what it's all about. And if you don't know about zero trust, this is your first time of hearing about zero trust, uh, you can look into it. Uh, and 800 uh, dash 818, uh, 81, 81, uh, this is also really big. Most people don't know this, uh, but for staffing or for uh, cybersecurity uh, workforce, this is the Bible for cybersecurity workforce. I think this is the only framework out there or only standard in the world that focuses on uh the workforce side of cybersecurity right so it gives you uh this is the framework that categorizes cybersecurity into the seven main categories and uh, 53 specialty areas and uh 40 uh, 54 uh work rules and it breaks it down into exactly what knowledge skills abilities you need to function effectively as a cybersecurity professional you know in any role right this is a very important framework but not very familiar, uh, but today you know, so you can dig into this as well. Now, NIST uh, 800-66, implementing HIPAA security rules. Uh, so we will, let's jump into uh, the, the whole list, the whole entire list for the NIST publications, right? So I'm going to share my screen and then share that one, and we will see what we are dealing with. So I hope everybody can see my screen. Now, this, so a combination of 
uh, special publication 800, special publication 1800, uh, special publication 500. Uh, if we add all of it together, it's around 200 and, uh, 235, right? And this is it right here. So we are going down the list. Uh, we are starting with the 800 series. Uh, 800 series, I think like the maximum or like the largest number they have in the 1800 series is 36. And we are not going to talk about each single one or like each single framework. And for before I even move on, so for Michael and everybody else, uh, when we talk about NIST uh, cybersecurity frameworks, this is the list, right? All of it. This is all of it. The list, the entire list, uh, with the exception of the cybersecurity, the NIST cybersecurity framework itself, which is also a framework. Uh, we will look at that. But for the special publications, uh, this is the entire list, right? For all the special publications, 500, 800, uh 1800 this is the entire list that we are going to go through uh Elikum, Elikum has her hand raised up uh, please go ahead before we continue yeah i was going to ask is it possible to share with us the link to this uh list yeah yeah uh, i'll share that link with everybody on here uh okay thank that you. is too easy yes Okay, so we are going down the list. Uh, there is only one framework, which is the NIST cybersecurity framework that is not on here because it's not part of the special publication. We will talk about that <coughs> once we've gone through this. Uh, sorry about that. So this is the entire list, right? The 800 series, we started with 800. Now, the one that I want you to keep an eye on is implementing zero class architecture. Uh, so, and also going down this list, uh, this is how to know what you are getting yourself into so mostly it will start with the uh, with a framework number so this is special publication uh, 1800-36 it will give you the title so what it covers right this one covers uh, trusted internet of things device network layer uh, onboarding and lifecycle management right and then it will give you uh, the date so last time it was updated and then the status if you see drafts it means they are still working on it Right, but they have the draft the draft out for people still to use, right? So they are still working on it. Uh, if it is in the draft stage, so mostly uh, sometimes, and it is also going to state here that is draft. You are still you will still be able to use the draft, uh, because they are just uh, they are almost done with it, uh, but they are still fine tuning some part of it. So it is still good because this is supposed to be best practices, right? So it is not set in stone. Uh, so that is for the 1800-35 uh, is one of the area, one of the frameworks to keep your eye uh, on. So all these are frameworks. When we say frameworks or standards, all these, the whole list. So 5G cybersecurity, uh, we will keep going down the list. That's 31. So for the 800, I think the 35 is, all of it is really important based on where you find yourself. Uh, but at least I'm showing you where to find what, right? So if in any organization you find yourself, you're supposed to do something on, you know, in cybersecurity and you have no clue how where to start, go to next special publication, you will find what you are looking for, right? And now we will go to the actual website. So this, uh, we made a PDF of the website to make it easy for us to go through, but we'll go to the actual website and everybody will see how to search for stuff on there as well. So, uh, Recovery from ransomware and other destructive uh, uh, events. Well, this is also critical. Uh, that is why it is highlighted on here. So, uh, and it's very common. Almost everybody, you know, gets ransomware attacks uh, of late. And IT asset management, asset management, uh, is also very important. Uh, so you can keep an eye on that as well. Uh, Okay, and uh, getting started with cybersecurity cyber uh, framework. So getting started with cybersecurity uh, framework, we will look at NIST cybersecurity framework itself, uh, but this is uh, a guide to how to use NIST cybersecurity framework. Okay. And 
NIST has uh, annual cybersecurity and privacy reports, so which is a really good read. Uh, they have one that came up in September for 2021. I think it's 44 pages. Uh, I'll, we will probably also share the link. You can, you know, it's a good read. And if you want to be a student of the industry, that is where to get some really good info. And they have this almost every year, right? Not almost every year. Uh, so that is something that you can also look into. So going down the list. Okay, now we are starting the 800 series. So the 1800 series ended somewhere up there. Oh, I didn't even know we got into the, okay, it ended up here, right? Now the 800 series starts from here. And all these draft drafts, uh, a couple of them are, so this is not like, this is the final, this is not a draft. And this is also the 2021 report. So or from the top, it was, uh, so this is like the final report. I think I have that report. And this is a 2020 uh, version. So this is the 200, uh, 200 and so, uh, 207, next special publication, 800, 207, uh, that I was talking about, the uh, zero trust architecture. Uh, they, it came about not too long ago, right? Uh, so I think 2020, probably when they started the draft, uh, but I'm not sure if they like the final was in 2020, because they just published it, I'm pretty sure like this year or last year. And now what NIST is doing also is translating all these publications into other languages as well. So it is also going to indicate if uh, they have other languages on there. They're also going to indicate it on there. So now most of the government, uh, uh, most of the use that you encounter will be in the 800 series. That doesn't mean you are not using anything in the 1800 and the 500. So for, okay. Uh, the workforce framework for cybersecurity. Everybody should check this out. Uh, this is 800-181. This is a really good place. If you want to start anything in cybersecurity or if you want to progress in cybersecurity, uh, this is an area for you to identify the skill sets, the knowledge, and the abilities you need to be able to move to the next level or even to start. Right. So it's a really good place to uh, get some good info when it comes to cybersecurity workforce. Now, I think, was it, uh, somebody talked about 171. Oh, I'm not sure if it was 171. So this is 171, right? Yeah. And with 171, so some of the uh, publications they have, or some of the frameworks, they have uh, three different variants of it. So they'll have A, B, uh, mostly a b and then uh i've not seen c in any of it but uh, mostly they'll have two types uh so to, an, a, like an extension of it right so kind of something similar like that um then 800-161 focuses on so when you are doing anything risk management uh you are going to add this also to it uh a cyber security supply chain risk management it forms uh, a vital part of your entire risk management. And sometimes even your incident response, you are going to also have that uh, included in there. As you can see, the list is the whole list of it, right? Uh, but I'm just moving it really fast to the highlighted ones, and then we'll move on. Okay, uh, 114. So 114 became really popular during COVID, right? Uh, so because it was for telework and bring your own device. And I know most of you, if you've gone through the uh, entry-level course, at least you know bring your own device and 
you know, uh, the other forms of how we use uh, devices at work. But this is big during COVID. Almost everybody and their mom was rushing to this to see some of the best practices when it comes to telework. And using either your own device for work or using work device also for personal use kind of at home also. All right, 800-82 uh, is a guide for ICS. Uh, so ICS for anybody who is who works, you know, uh, in any big industrial setting, uh, manufacturing or uh, on electric companies, uh, water companies, you know, you'll be familiar with ICS. So this is a guide to how to use ICS uh, to make sure your ICS is safe. And 800-66 uh, focuses on how to implement HIPAA. Now, 800-61 uh, is the handbook or guide on how computer uh, security incidents should be handled. So incident response, this is your baby, right? So this together with, was it? Uh, 161, I'm not sure. And then uh, with, I, it's mostly like a combination of, I think a combination of like three or four for incident response. Uh, risk management, I think I was confusing that with risk management combination. So, and also saying that that is to let you know that uh, you can use more than two or three or four of these frameworks at the same time to enforce, to make sure, you know, you are uh, covering all areas uh, when it comes to either risk management or incident response. Or, and uh, so 800-53, uh, this is version version five, right? It has gone through a lot of uh, versions over the years, but they have the B and I think, yes, they have B and A uh, versions. Uh, so this is kind of where everything starts, right? When you have to use uh, NEST uh, 800 series, mostly uh, it starts here. So this is where everything is laid out and then all other frameworks will follow. Not to say you cannot use any other framework uh, without using this, but this gives you... So let's say if you are new to cybersecurity, uh, aside using the handbook, uh, Cyber Speedy Handbook that we kind of looked at, uh, which is one of the frameworks. I've forgotten the the, the number, but uh, 53 for government agencies. This is where everything starts. And 53B gives you uh, how to do baselining uh, for information systems and organizations. And uh, 53A uh, is assessing security and privacy controls itself and i think now from that i will jump into the 37 uh yes the 30 series so uh, 800-39 focuses on managing information uh, security risks so this is one of the uh, frameworks you are going to use with your RMF, uh, the 800-37, right? So, uh, 800-37, yeah, this is the RMF framework. And 30, you're also going to, so 30 also shows you how to conduct risk assessments. So this is also uh, one of the, uh, like one of the free, uh, one of the frameworks you are going to use in conjunction with your uh, RMF framework. So uh, is the 39, 37, and this one was what uh, 30. And 16, uh, 800 or 16 covers uh, information security training or awareness training. 
and introduction to information security. So if you are a beginner, this is a good place to start, right? 800 that's 12. And that is all of it. Uh, yes, so with a 500 series, I think it's only three or four uh, that we have here so far, right? So this is it. This is all the special publications that there is. Right. So we are going to continue with where we left off on our presentation. Now we are going to uh, look at the NIST cybersecurity framework. So let's not get ourselves confused. Uh, the NIST, when we say NIST cyber frameworks, uh, is not so when we say NIST frameworks, we are referring to all the NIST frameworks uh, or all the NIST standards for cybersecurity. Now NIST has a cybersecurity framework. I don't know if that makes sense. They, are, they have a standard that is called NIST cybersecurity framework, right? That is different from any of the special publications. Right. So the special publications, they are also frameworks, NIST frameworks for cybersecurity, but then NIST has a, a, a standard or a framework that is called the NIST cybersecurity framework. I hope that makes sense. So we have all the special publications and then the NIST cybersecurity framework. So the NIST cybersecurity framework uh, is a guideline not mandated uh, for corporate side to use uh, for government agencies is you know like a uh, a good standard to follow. So uh, these set of guidelines or best practices, uh, <laughs> the intent of it is to help reduce and manage cyber risks within an organization, right? And it was developed with collaboration between the government side, academia, and the corporate side. Right. So we will look at uh, the next cybersecurity framework page as well. So we, we will show you where to find all these. Now, the history behind uh, the next cybersecurity framework, <clears throat> also still backed by law, uh, the United States government came up with uh, an executive order, a presidential executive order, in 2013 for improving critical uh, infrastructure security, uh, cyber security. So uh, improving critical infrastructure cyber security. So uh, the order through this NIST was directed to come up with a framework that is going to be kind of the, uh, like the measuring rod or the yardstick for cyber security. So although they had all these uh, special publications that they are working on. The special publications are targeting different areas in cybersecurity, right? The next cybersecurity framework is supposed to uh, help us navigate the whole entire cybersecurity sphere, if that makes sense. And the special publications, just uh, from the name, they are targeting special areas within cybersecurity. But the cyber screening, the cyber screening frameworks framework itself, uh, the intent of it is to help us navigate the whole entire cyber security sphere, right? So uh, NIST, as a government agency, they were the ones who were taxed based on the executive order that was given, right? And they came up with what we know today as the cyber, NIST cyber security framework. So. When I said NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, the goal behind it is to help us navigate the whole entire cyber uh, security or information security sphere. Uh, this is what they came up with, right? So they've categorized cybersecurity or activities that we do within cybersecurity into uh, five main areas. And the five main areas are uh, identify, protect, detect, respond, and, and uh, recover, right? So under these areas, there is a whole list of activities that we can do. Uh, so this framework is to help us navigate uh, cybersecurity or help us at, uh, address cybersecurity in a more formalized way 
uh, in a more structured way to help reduce risks within our organizations. So uh, we will just take a little look or little peek into what goes into uh, the next cybersecurity framework. So uh, if you are not getting anything out of this today, at least you should know that uh, cybersecurity, when it comes to uh, navigating cybersecurity within any organization, uh, if you don't know how to where to start from, at least you can start from. Uh, you, you can you know use these uh, five uh, five elements within the NIST cybersecurity framework to tackle cybersecurity within any setting. Right. So first is to identify. Uh, the next is to protect, detect, uh, respond, and recover. And under identify, there is a list of activities that you do. So you. Uh, you do assets management, business environment governance, risk assessment, uh, risk management, and the list goes on. Under protect, you know, assets control, a whole list of it. Under detect, everything that you, you need to do, right? So these are uh, broad areas. Or, or, uh, this is to give you an idea of what and where you can start uh, your cybersecurity uh, from within any organization, right? Uh, so. This is just a little sneak peek into the NIST cybersecurity framework. Right? So we have the NIST cybersecurity framework and then all the other pub special publications that we looked at. Okay. So uh, we are going to open the floor for questions. And then we will, I think lastly, we will look at, or we will share the, uh, the, the link to the cybersecurity special publication page. And then uh, also to the cybersecurity framework page as well. Right, so uh, that is going to be the end of our presentation. If you have any questions uh, for the group, you can bring it up. So I think we will share this. So I'm going to share the screen for the special publication and we can all take a look at it. So this is the page for the special publication. Uh, it's pasted in there. So everybody is in the chat. So everybody can have a look at it. Uh, so this is it. You can type in here whatever you want to search. Uh, also, if you know the numbers, you can type in the numbers uh, and it's going to pull it up. But this is like a whole list of it. Now, uh, I'm going to share the other pages as well. Yep, and uh, I'll address all questions that we have on here shortly. Uh, Uh, Alikum, please go ahead with your question whilst I'm, I'm pulling this up. So uh, my question is, um, given the, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So given the different um, frameworks within NIST, Mm -hmm. uh, what would you recommend for somebody who may not necessarily be looking to work in government to focus on? Okay, so uh, some of the special publications or the NIST frameworks that cuts across uh, all industries, government or corporate, uh, one is incident response, uh, risk management, yes, you can still use risk management. Uh, disaster recovery and business continuity. Uh, and uh, asset management, right, baselining. So all those you can use. And there's a maybe probably like a uh, quite like a handful that you can use, right? Uh, but mostly uh, depending on where you find yourself. But generally, like what I've said, uh, you can use all of those, like those cuts, like they, they they cut across all industries. I use them, you know, in other corporate settings, 
uh, aside, you know, government maybe gigs that I would do. And so, uh, so uh, just a follow up. So the pa uh, special publications, um, are we referring to this as maybe guides, guides, guidelines, or they're still frameworks? No, we call them frameworks. Okay. So standards or frameworks. Uh, Randall, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'll just say in general, uh, you can have uh, schools, if you will, or businesses, there'll be an ISO house, right? I'll, across their entire business, their ISO. And I would expect uh, could be the same, uh, I'll say in the public sector that they mm -hmm. may use NIST. Are you seeing any trends like banking? They may use NIST. Or obviously, if they're a supplier to the government, they may obviously use NIST. But any trends of that nature, I'll, I'll say, you know, typical approaches that you see per large industries like restaurants, for example, they may not use NIST. They would go to maybe ISO, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, regardless of the industry, right, uh, when it comes to uh, information security, uh, most of these standards, they cross over. So with NIST, uh, the ones that are kind of uh, very uh, set in stone for the government, those do not necessarily apply. But let's say you find yourself, you are uh, the CISO or you are security analyst in maybe, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, McDonald's, right? And you have to ensure that they are like everything they are doing in terms of like security is good. Uh, what you are looking for or uh, what is your agenda is to identify some of the best practices, right? Cybersecurity best practices that are out there. Now, NIST has a bunch of it. So an example, when it comes to incident response. So let's say I'm setting up an incident response program for any company, regardless of the industry. Right? Yes. The best practices that I need uh, they kind of cut across different uh, frameworks, right? So mm -hmm. I'll pick something from ISO. Uh, I'll pick something from NIST. I'll pick something from CIS controls, right? Because mm -hmm. what I want to do is uh, I want to be able to have it set up where it is like a net, right? If one framework doesn't catch something, the other mm -hmm. one is going to catch it. Right? So mostly oh, yeah. uh, in practice, uh, it's good to use at least two, three or more frameworks uh, just stack them on, like on top of each other to make sure that uh, if one misses something, uh, the other one is going to catch it. So with NIST, uh, when it comes to general areas like you know disaster recovery, business continuity, uh, mm -hmm. things that are not very specific to the government side, uh, we all borrow. I mean, and when I say we all, everybody in the industry borrows from NIST. And one uh, typical example is this. So for the NIST cybersecurity framework that we just looked at, Almost everybody and their mom uses it. Right? Okay. So identify, detect, and all that recover. Everybody uses that to kind of structure their uh, security, uh, like whatever they are doing for uh, their security program. Right. So I hope that helps. Yes, it does. That makes perfect sense. Use the various standards to create a hybrid approach based on the circumstance or what's needed. Yeah, that's yes. beautiful. Thanks. Uh, Elikum, I think Jimmy had his hand up, but then he yes. Yeah. Had a question about the like the organizational framework. Does NIST have is it the NIST have um, a framework for the organization that maybe they don't maybe it's not mature is trying to become mature, and they need cybersecurity related policies and uh, and processes and procedures. I, uh, so though they wouldn't necessarily be technical standards, but there was there'll be required policies that would mandate things throughout the organization. Um, would that be on the governance for NIST? Uh, so if I get your question right, uh, you asking if there is a NIST uh, publication for how organizations can move from maybe uh, zero from uh, like their cybersecurity, uh, like maturity standpoint, right? So 
an organization yeah, with yeah. no nothing and how are they going to progress from having nothing in terms of security and then moving to the point where maybe they are tier one tier two or tier three uh, in terms of their security maturity is that what you're asking yeah and what guidance is available for what type of policies the organization needs to define that will support the um, the processes, the procedures, and the controls and standards. Okay. The one of the things others look for is what policy is driving compliance for the for the technology throughout the organization. Okay. So uh, I'll address this in two folds. So for uh, a publication that is going to help you uh, do an assessment of where you are, right, and do gap analysis to be able to move you from you know, maturity, uh, maturity stage zero in cybersecurity to maybe stage one, two, three, depending on how you want to categorize it. Now, uh, a framework for that is the NIST cybersecurity framework, right? So the okay. NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, when we dive deep into it, uh, we are able to, they have uh, what they call uh, implementation tiers. So you have tier one, tier two, tier three, right? Tier three is you've arrived, right? Tier one is you have nothing. <laughs> Right, okay. so, uh, and there is like a progression of how you'll be able to get from tier one to tier three. They list everything that you need. Okay, okay. N now, in terms of policies, uh, depending on uh, when we talk about uh, like compliance or when we are looking uh, specifically at uh, GRC, uh, we have to first understand what industry the organization is in, right? Uh, what standards are mandated by law and which ones are mandated by industry that they have to yeah. stay. Yeah. So uh, an example, if there is uh, AFIS, right? AFIS for like all the military folks on here, AFIS uh, is uh, a government agency within the uh, Department of Defense that, you know, uh, they are the ones who run the, like, let's say, uh, like the uh, shops on base, right? So mm -hmm. uh, with AFIS, AFIS is a government agency, so they have to follow uh, FESMA, they have to, like, they have to follow 800-53, uh, they have to follow 800-37, uh, which is uh, RMF, and everything that comes with RMF, right? At the same time, because AFIS has an outlet that is accepting debit and credit cards, they have to stay in compliance with PCI DSS, right? If they are doing, so let's say if we take, if AFIS uh, also probably, let's say, provide uh, health insurance, and they sell health insurance on base, then they have to also stay in compliance with HIPAA, right? So if you are right. a analyst yeah. or you are the GRC manager, right, you have to understand uh, all these uh, complexities and be able to, when you are setting up a security program for the organization under the GRC area, you have to know that, okay, we have to look at PCI DSS, we have to look at HIPAA, right? I got government you. Agency, so we have to look at all these other government right. frameworks that we have to stay in compliance with, right? So that is going to inform the kind of policies that you are going to make. But uh, exactly. SANS, uh, if you go to uh, SANS, SANS.org, they have uh, a really good policy template, which they've categorized under the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, identify, recover, uh, detect. So under each of them, they have a list of policies uh, that you can you know, uh, uh, use within your organization. Thanks. Okay, that's SANS. Yes, yeah, SANS.org. Thank you. Yes. Aliku, go ahead. Um, yeah, Ma, I had a question. So let's say um, we have an international organization, like um, um, I'm thinking maybe um, some of these banks, international banks, uh, would they need to use both the U.S. Uh, framework slash standards and maybe European or Asian? And uh, do these uh, regions just follow what the U.S. is doing or they have their own um, frameworks and standards that they implement in their regions? Okay, good question. So... Uh, there is also like three folds to that question. Uh, if you are a business, right, uh, depending on where you are located, at, so your local area or your uh, jurisdiction is going to uh, 
come with some security responsibilities, and I mean cyber security responsibilities, right? Uh, and then also the industry that you are in is also going to come with some responsibilities. And I'm talking in terms of the compliance aspect of it, right? So if you are a U.S. company operating in U.S., you have to follow all the U.S. Uh, uh, mandated cybersecurity compliance laws or rules or standards or frameworks, right? Uh, if you are within a certain state, you have to follow that as well, right? Now, an example, so let's say you are a bank, if you are operating in uh, California, you have to follow the California CCPA, the uh, Privacy uh, Act, you have to follow that, right? Uh, you have to follow all other, you know, uh, uh, they all other frameworks uh, or all other standards within the United States. Uh, if you go outside the US, you are operating now probably in France. You have to follow uh, the European data privacy standard, which is a GDPR, right? Uh, so you have to follow that there and everything else that they have there. Now for the industry, because you're in the banking sector, uh, if you have to follow PCI DSS, that is industry uh, industry mandated. It's not location mandated, right? Uh, so we have the industry loca uh, industry mandated, uh, government mandated, which is mostly going to be tied into your, uh, uh, like where you are located. And then uh, we have ones that are just best practices. So we have standards or framework that are just best practices, right? If you follow them, fine. Uh, if not, nobody is going to you know, uh, hold you for it, right? So an example of some of the best practices uh, is when it comes to NIST. If you are not a government agency and you, like everything NIST is best practice, right? Okay. So you don't have to follow it, whether you are in the States or not. Uh, if you're a government agency, a federal government agency for the United States government, then you have to follow the ones that you have to follow, right? Uh, for industry, if you are uh, within the United States and you are working in the health industry, you have to follow HIPAA. That is a law. You have to follow HIPAA. Uh, if you go outside the United States, you don't need HIPAA. Right? So depending on, uh, that is why it is very uh, critical for you to have a better understanding of what your organization is doing if you are working in any GRC setting. right? Uh, because the last thing you want to do is not to know what uh, standards you have to stay in compliance with. I mean, I think, I don't know what kind of GRC analyst you are going to be or any GRC manager or anything that you are going to be. So you have to look at if for your security, for planning the security for the whole organization, you have to identify these first. Like these are just, you know, like this is very simple, basic things that you have to identify first before you even start looking at any other uh, best to, you know, like best practices that you want to use. So you first have to identify the mandatory ones and then you can, you know, add to it in terms of what other best practices that you want to uh, use. So I hope that answers your question, Ali. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. And I think Amadou was talking about blockchain, but we were not talking about this. I had one other question. Yes, go ahead, Randall. If you don't mind. It seems yes, like yes, um, it seems like the publications within NIST are um, uh, free of charge, whereas ISO, you know, you have to pay these uh, fees, relate, you know, things of that nature. But I'm sure there's a monetization within this somehow, or is or is it free, if you will? Oh, okay. But thank you very much. Uh, that was a point that I was going to stress on, but uh, totally, you know, I totally forgot about it. So uh, everything this is free. That's good. Ooh. Everything this is free because, and also for uh, copyright. Watch out a little. Also for uh, uh, like copyright, NIST, they don't have any uh, like copyright uh, obligations. All they do is you have to cite them, right? They encourage you to cite them if you use any of their publications, right? But they don't have like any stringent copyright laws and everything NIST is free. Everything NIST is free. So all you have to do is go to NIST's website. It's nist.gov and all these publications you are talking about, you find them there. So for ISO, yes, obviously everything ISO you have to buy. <laughs> so yes, uh, you are right, Randall. So but NIST, and and that is uh, that also informs uh, the use, right? So if I am just I want to you like add to my uh, 
Like I want to have some other frameworks which you know are not mandated, but they are best practices. And I have to buy ISO, but NIST is free. I'll probably go with NIST, <laughs> depending on where you work at, right? So. Yes, I mean, I, I'm loving this because I've created ISO manuals and then you have to be audited and, you know, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, thank you. Yes, you're welcome, Randall. So uh, I appreciate everybody's time. If there are no questions for the group, uh, we'll meet again next week before we break for the Christmas holidays. Uh, and I wish everybody a great weekend. And we will meet again yeah, doc, next week doctor, doc. if there are no questions. Yes, go ahead. Look, uh, yeah, um, I just want to ask if you have a webinar for showing, showing us how to use the NIST in implementation. Let's say um, picking the NIST, let's say the NIST 830, the guidelines, and then showing us how to input the controls into the guidelines for let's say compliance or um, um for controls yeah so for that uh, mostly if you join our uh workshop or internship programs uh we do that we actually go into the use of it right how to actually use it or how to implement it in an organization oh, okay yeah i wanted to stress on that that do you would do you do it on let's say the friday webinar or without one being intense you do it on implementation in terms of um so like that is going to be part of uh, our paid training i mean friday night an hour we cannot do any of those uh, that is okay. like too much yeah for us to yeah. even do on here so uh, okay. if you want any of those then you can you know look at like the catalog of uh courses that we have and you can get into but most uh, most uh, like mostly on our workshop uh, slash internship uh, that is where we do the actual implementation and that we you know we work for uh, uh, organizations working on actual security projects. So the implementation of it and everything and the different frameworks that we are using, you'll be able to see the implementation side of it as well. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, this will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, if you missed it or you want to look at the replay, it will be sent out so everybody will have it. Have a great and wonderful weekend. We'll meet again next week, Friday. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.